<laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Great. Well, my wife and I go back uh, a long ways in Micah's family, pastoring in Woodland, Maine, Baileyville, they call it now. Uh, many years ago, had the Kevin Grant, who is Micah's dad, and Harold Grant, his dad, his mom, Janie. Uh, they were not attending church anywhere, and uh, Harold working at the paper mill, Georgia Pacific Corporation, and uh, one day he saw on a Coles Express truck written on the side of it in big letters, forget exact same wording, but basically what it said was, don't send your kids to Sunday school or don't send your kids to church, but take them. So he said, went home and said to Janie, we need to start going to church. Then I had a couple I had led to Christ in the church and they were witnessing to them, witnessing to Harold on a regular basis. The man was, that man just went home to be with the Lord a few months, couple of months ago. And uh, Harold said to him, if you promise not to witness ever to me again, I'll go to church three Sundays in a row. And the guy agreed. So he came, he and Janie, the family, and uh, three Sundays in a row. And then everybody would probably figure that was it. But uh, Harold said to Janie and the family, we're going back. Well, it wasn't too long after that I had the joy of leading Kevin to Christ. And then his dad got saved a few months later. And uh, the mom actually had been saved as a young person, not been living for the Lord, got right with the Lord. And then God in his sovereign grace saw fit to take her home, a very young lady with cancer. And uh, so Kevin was a teenager at the time. And uh, his request was that if my, my wife could sort of be his second mom, and uh, so we've always considered Kevin the unofficial adopted son. So therefore, Mike is the unofficial adopted grandson, and his kids would be the great grandsons, right? So what a joy it is to know someone. I remember the first time that his dad preached. He preached for us at an Easter service, uh, six o'clock on Sunday morning. We used to have it, and we always had the teenagers have the entire meeting. So Micah, I'm excited to be here tonight. Many years ago, I was with your dad when he was pastoring up in Aristic County, and he said, I'll not be around tomorrow. I have to go down to Woodland. They've asked me to speak at a pastor's conference. And I said, well, I'll go down with you. He said, I'd rather you didn't, <laughs> but I went anyway. So let's give him a good hand as he comes to share tonight. I was not anticipating that. Um, you know, hearing that that story, and it, it's it's a beautiful story. I never met my grandmother. Um, the The quote on the side of the truck was, "Fathers take their families to church." Can you imagine that on a side of a truck nowadays? And he had said. Three weeks, and don't witness to me again in three weeks. God is a powerful God, isn't he? And, and it's hard to believe that, you know, I'm standing here today because of that truck, because of Brother Calder witnessing to my grandfather, to then my dad becoming a saved man and going into the ministry. And it's really just kind of mind-blowing when you think about the, the lineage and how God works. And uh, boy, you know, you don't feel worthy. You just, you know, of all the people to pick. So anyways... It's a, it's a real blessing to be standing up here. And I was going to start with something a little funnier, and so I'll still start with it. I was, uh, my, I'm a pacer, by the way. I'm going to move back and forth here multiple times. So I, Stan does it all the time. I can't do the turkey like he does, but, <laughs> but uh, I pace. And so I had somebody, uh, I said, somebody asked me. Somebody found out at work that I was going to be doing this, and, and uh, they said, are you, are you nervous? And I said, actually... No, I'm not. I'm not nervous. I said, I'm more nervous to speak to the kids. Something about speaking to kids. They don't have social etiquette yet. You're going to smile and nod. You're going to come up after and tell me how great it was and how good I was. And then no, <laughs> go home and tell your wife, that guy was, uh, wow. But the kids, if you don't hold their interest, if there is not some truth and some entertainment, they will see through it, and their body language will show you that they're not into it. So I was more nervous for the kids 
25 minutes ago because we're just getting started and it's good to be back and we haven't been back since March 13th. So it's good to be back with the kids and I'm, I'm really excited to be up here. And so we're going to jump right in. I was told, do not go over your time. So we got to jump right in here. Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. And uh, in, in full confession, I have an NIV, I have an NIV Bible. It is a Dr. David Jeremiah NIV Bible, though. I'll just throw that out there. And I, I almost printed the King James version of this, and I apologize. I will try to do that next time. I know a lot of you uh, use that. Obviously, Pastor Stan uses it. And we're going to pick up in verse 5, 1, 5, and we're going to go about 15 verses, 16 verses. We're going to talk about Zechariah. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who, longed, who belonged to the priestly division of Abisha. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came and all the assembled worshipers were praying outside, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other for men to drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elisha to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, to their children, excuse me, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you the good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true, at their appointed time. We're going to stop right there. When Stan and I had, oh, I think this conversation in respect to uh, me coming up and, and doing some preaching and some pastoring, and, and when we had started this conversation, Amanda and I were, um, through a variety of things that have happened in our marriage and in my professional career, we have been, and I'm sure most of you have been, we have really been seeking the Lord and his will in our life, especially in respect to ministry. And I had been, again, we have been praying about this and praying about this. And there was a time late last spring that Amanda and I really felt like God was opening a door for us to leave the profession that I am in. And Well, I shouldn't say leave completely, but to take a different pathway to relocate geographically, um, pretty significant geographical uh, relocation. And um, we, were, we were saying goodbye to certain family members and saying goodbye and talking to uh, pastors about that. And, and we really thought we were leaving. And at the last second, that door got shut. And I remember thinking at the time when the doors were opening, because it wasn't just one door, it was a series of doors we were moving through. And I don't want to really bore you with the details, and it would just take too long. And some of them, they were, I believe they were miraculous. Um, Pastor Mark was part of one of those. Um, I, when that door got shut, we just shook our heads and went, God, this is not the answer that we prayed for. Like, we accepted the fact that we were going to move. We accepted the career change. And the door has been shut. Like, what about all these other doors we just walked through? And it's funny because we had been processing that prayer and that answer over the last six months. Like, trying to figure out, right, what was God doing? And it's funny because then Stan asked me, and, and by the way, if I stink, go talk to him after service. 
Stan asked me to, um, you know, consider doing this, and, and I really was excited to do it, and I felt like it was an answer to prayer. And I had just finished reading Luke chapter 1, and all of a sudden, Zechariah hit me. Like, I read it in a different way. Isn't it amazing when you read the Word of God, and it hits you, something jumps out at you that you had never noticed before. And Zechariah was that man for me. Zechariah was this person who had such a negative stigma attached to him. Negative connotation. I know how I used to view Zachariah all the way through elementary school, middle school, youth group. Zachariah was the guy when the angel said, you're going to have a son, went, ah, I'm too old. And I thought, how could anybody with the angel of Gabriel standing there telling you you're going to have a son, how could anybody doubt the answer to those prayers that, I mean, the angel Gabriel says, your prayer has been heard. How could anybody question that? And as I read Luke 1, and I was thinking about our six months, and I was thinking about coming up here, I thought, this has got to be a sermon. And the sermon is, we should all want to be Zechariah. I'll say it again. Because you're like, no. <laughs> we should all want to be Zechariah. We just don't want to have a Zechariah moment. We should all want to be Zechariah but we don't want to have a Zachariah moment. And so the, I want to take step one. We just need to exonerate him, and I need to prove to you why we should want to be Zachariah. And then step two, I'm going to show you, <laughs> through the word, not my own personal life, I'm going to show you how to avoid the Zachariah moment. So you're with me. you got the general outline. By the way, I'm a teacher. That's my, my profession. That's how I was trained and educated. So I, I think in like outline format very like distinctly because I have to give this to 15-year-olds and make sure they get it. So I apologize. That's just how my brain works. All right. So why should we want to be like Zachariah? Let's exonerate him. I'm going to take you back to Zachariah's introduction. Zachariah, notice how he is introduced in verse 5. Zechariah belonged to the priestly division of Abisha, and his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Now, we, I, I was thinking about exactly what you just introduced. My grandfather would tell you that we are from a lineage of poachers and thieves and scoundrels. <laughs> We're from Wood of Pitlock. And so if, if you, anybody's got a connection to Wood of Pitlock, um, don't look up the grant name because it's probably only in the police register or something like that. But uh, he would say, I came from nothing, right? How could I be used? Zechariah did not have that problem. He has pedigree, right? But thank God, God does not rely on pedigree to accomplish his work, amen? And we see it time and time again. We see Saul, or Paul, stating, I was a Jew among Jews. It didn't matter. It didn't matter you were Jew among Jews. He talks about being crucified daily. Ironically, we see Saul stating, who am I? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. My clan is the least of these. Saul didn't give God enough credit. Saul wanted to make it all about his pedigree. And the people made it all about Saul's pedigree, right? His height, his stature. Zechariah has the pedigree, but that's not where it stops. I love this next verse. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. And again, Luke, so detailed, uh, just love, I love Luke's version of the gospel and how he writes, the perspective that he writes. He says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Think about that for a second. Think about who Zechariah was. Zechariah was a priest in, right, right at the turn of the century, what do we know 30 years later about the priestly line and the Pharisees and the Sadducees that Jesus dealt with? Good guys? Love the Lord with all their heart? No. No. In fact, we see right here, not only do we know he observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, in probably a profession that was pretty dirty at that time, probably had quite a few scoundrels in it, but he also led his wife. He also was the leader of his household because it said both of them 
walked in the Lord's decrees blamelessly. And I find it really interesting. And if you don't read the Bible, if you read like this, if you read a study Bible, if you have a concordance, I think those things are great. Um, I often read the first time around on an iPad because it gives me so many cross-references and I can go really fast back and forth. There's a very interesting cross-reference to this word blameless. And it's used to describe another person in the Old Testament. Anybody know who that is? There's another man that walks blamelessly. Enoch, I was actually going even farther back. Noah, very good. Genesis, flip with me quickly to Genesis 6. At the beginning of Genesis 6, we have an introduction to Noah. And if we go to verse 9... Noah and the flood, right? I mean, and again, famous, very famous account. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And it was interesting. I read that, and I was reading that cross-reference, and I thought, man, I would much rather have been Noah, right? Noah had that clear direction from God, right? Build me an ark. And then Amanda and I were talking about, who would you rather have been, Zechariah or Noah? Have that clear direction from God, but be ostracized in society? Or live every single day of your life blameless, upright, walking with God, leading your family, just doing life day to day, and have probably the worst, I can't say the worst, but have one of the most significant hurts you could bear and try to deal with. And what was that hurt that they were trying to deal with and bear? They were childless. And we know in that time frame, that was viewed as, that was a sin, that was disgrace. Elizabeth even speaks to that later on in that passage. She says, the Lord has taken away my disgrace when she's pregnant at five months. That's one of her praises. And so I thought it was a really interesting parallel, and I think it sets us up nicely to say, We should want to be like Zechariah. When terms like blameless and upright get thrown around and they're used on Noah, and then they're later on used with Zechariah, I think Zechariah is a pretty good guy, given what he did, the time frame he lived in, and to have the description that he had. So, would you agree with me? Zechariah is now exonerated. Do we want to be like Zechariah? Thank you. Sure. I'll take sure. So, I think the better part of this equation comes down to how do we avoid having the Zechariah moment? How do we avoid the angel speaking to us and saying, God, how is is this possible? All right. So let's go back. We'll go back to, I would uh, flip back to Luke 1. And I think Zechariah did three things wrong. Every good sermon's got to have one, two, or three, or A, B, and C. I've got one, two, and three. I like numbers. I think the first thing that Zechariah did wrong, and I think we often do wrong as well, and so the the human principle here, I think Zechariah forgot his history. And in particular, he forgot God's history. Zechariah forgot God's history. Had God ever, in the history of the Old Testament, sent an angel to tell somebody they would have a child despite not being able to. I'm being a little sarcastic. Multiple times, right? This has happened multiple times. Do you think Zechariah knew his scripture? As a priest and a Jewish boy in that time frame? Yes, you're nodding your heads. Yes, he absolutely. He would have known who? What stories? He would have known Hannah and Samuel. Very good. He would have also known who? Samson and Manoah. He would have known who? Abraham. He would have even known Hagar and Ishmael. I mean, not necessarily barrenness, but at least a blessing. He would have known those stories. And yet, Zechariah forgot God's history. Now, I'll go a step further and say, A lot of times, we forget God's history. 
I felt really guilty as I was diving into this point because, again, my lovely wife, we started talking about God answering prayer and, in particular, doubting the answer, not understanding the answer. And we started keeping a list. We started making a list. Have you ever done that before? Kept a list? I know a lot of people keep prayer journals, but in particular, have you ever kept a list and just check stuff off as God's answered them? Anybody ever done that before? I would suggest you do it and don't do it. <laughs> because the amazing thing is, God always answers prayer. Sometimes no answer is an answer. We've always talked about that. Sometimes it takes a long time. But when you start going, and when we went through our life and started figuring out all the times, you know, okay, yep, there was an answer there to a child health concern. Oh, there was a professional answer right there. Oh, there's a relational answer right there. I hate saying this. There were several bear and deer answers right there. Um, I, I love to hunt, and I was telling Ryan uh, Dearborn a couple days ago, I was sitting in the bear stand last Saturday night, and uh, I remember I started praying, Lord, this isn't fair. I just want to shoot a bear. I've sat like five. Whoa, I'm Lord, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I take that back right now. I'm sorry. I don't. And I, that night, it, it happened that night. That night, I went to my hunting journal. And you know what I noticed at the last line of about, oh, 20-something hunting stories through the last 12 years? You know what the last line was on almost every single one of them? God is good. God answers prayer. And I know that might seem like a trivial thing to you folks. Um, I'm a very competitive person. If you ever seen my dad, talk to my dad, um, listen to him, anything, that has been beaten into us as kids, this competitiveness. And we take that beyond sports. We take that to Monopoly, and we take that into hunting. I mean, all the things you can be competitive on. And uh, it's really important to me. But when I read those journals, I just think, oh, my word. Like, he always answers prayer. And anytime I doubt him, boy, I better check my own history. And whether that's my own personal history, my mom's been cancer-free for eight years now. Amen. Amen. God has a long history with his people. And he answers the prayer of his people. We need to remember that when we get an answer that surprises us so that we're not expecting, or maybe we're waiting. He doesn't let us down. So, Zechariah forgot his history. I think the other really important thing besides history, number two, Zechariah forgot his scripture. I don't know about you folks, but a lot of times the answers to my prayers come from my Bible. It comes in a quiet time. It comes when I've been reading, and then I start to meditate on that word. It comes from hearing pastor speak, hearing Mark speak, going to Sunday school, whatever it might be. And when I was studying Zechariah, I thought, right there in black and white. I, in my mind, I go, that's why Gabriel wasn't enough, because Zechariah wasn't focused on the right thing. Well, let me take you back into Luke for a second. Let's look at Luke Let's look at Luke chapter 1. Let's look at 16. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit of, and power of Elisha to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a per, people prepared for the Lord. Does anybody know what Gabriel is saying right there? I always just read right through that. He is quoting somebody. Who's he quoting? Anybody know? Malachi. It's a great name. I love that name. <laughs> That's the name of my oldest son, Malachi. Malachi is a fascinating book. The last book of the Old Testament. Four chapters long. Short, quick read. Malachi is a prophet. They're in captivity. He is speak well, they're in that captivity. They've rebuilt, obviously, with Nehemiah. They're about to go into the 400 silent years, right? The last book, we have a prophet 
speaking to the, the people of that time frame, in particular the priests of that time frame, and he is saying, you have wronged the people. You have abused them. You have stolen their sacrifices. You have led them in false worship. And they're being very cynical, and they're saying, what, how have we done that? And Malachi ends, Mal, Malachi ends the book talking about the coming of the Messiah. You don't believe me? Flip to Malachi 4, 5, and 6. I printed this one so I wouldn't have to flip back and forth. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. So one of the last verses of the chapter. See, I will send the prophet Elisha to you before the great and dreadful day the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I would strike the land with total destruction. Gabriel is citing Malachi. He's saying, Zechariah, wake up! This is the moment. The silence is over. Not only are you going to have a son, he is going to be the forebear to the Messiah. Wow. We know with Galatians, right? We, it doesn't matter that it's an angel. It doesn't matter that it's your pastor. What should you always do with an answer to prayer? How should you test it? Paul talks about it in Galatians 1.8. Even if it's of angels, if it's not the gospel, if it's not Jesus, it's no good. And Gabriel is giving that to Zechariah. He's quoting Malachi. He's saying, this time frame is over, and your son is the one. How cool is that? Man, what a moment that must have been. We also have some other scripture that he quotes. I don't think they're as significant, but I can tell you as attempting to raise three sons, I would like a handbook. If somebody has one, that'd be great. We had this great one on sleep. That has been a lifesaver. But other than that, there's not a handbook. And yet, he gives him a handbook. He gives him a little bit of insight on what this child is going to be like. He's going to be filled with the Spirit, Jeremiah 1.5. He knows he's going to be a prophet. He also says, and he'll take part of the Nazarite vow. We don't know about the long hair. We can only assume, based upon John's appearance, he probably had long hair. But we know that wasn't where his spirit came from. His spirit was already in him prior to, you know, obviously at conception. But he also says he's not to take fermented drink, number 6.3, Right? Gabriel is giving him scripture to fall back on. And that is so critical when we're looking, especially in our time frame. I don't know about you, uh, I've had no audible moments with God. I've heard the still silence, the whisper, but I haven't had the audible moment. But to validate that in truth, to hear it through godly preaching, I can tell you that that gives me the assurance that I need to know, this is what God will have for me. And Zechariah forgot that. So, Zechariah forgot his history or God's history, probably both. Zechariah forgot his scripture. And I think the last thing that's really important in respect to Zechariah, and I hesitated because you should probably put your best point at the end. I think this is my second best point. So, I'm going st- to roll with it. But I think it is so applicable to us as people to this principle of us is that Zechariah, he really forgot his place. And what I mean by that is he, he forgot that God puts us in a specific place at a specific time for a specific reason, right? Have you ever felt that way before? a witnessing opportunity, a job, a moment to stand in the gap. Somebody's told you you were exactly what they needed at that time. And I think Zachariah forgot that. And I think we're really good at remembering it when it goes well. But when it doesn't go well, I think we have a harder time. Oh, yeah, God put me in this position. And I'm going to give you an example. Zachariah's example and then a a personal example or another historical example. Biblical example. Do you know the odds of Zechariah being selected, right? Where was he when this message was delivered? Anybody know? He was at his duties in the temple. Yes, that's correct. 
He was the burner of the incense. Now, just to give you a little history, there are 20,000 estimate, rough estimate, there are 20,000 priests in this time frame. Right? 20,000 priests. There would have been about eight divisions, so take that 20,000 divided by eight, if you, you, know, you want to make it even, two and a half-ish thousand apiece. They're then broken into, um, uh, like, um, houses, right? So they take the divisions, they break them into houses again. Zechariah, it says, the lot fell to him. They only served one week every six months. So priests only went to the temple and out of these houses. They only served for one week. They went home. They came back six, seven months later and served another week. There are only three positions that can be served. There's the guy who, the priest who cleans the altar. There's the priest that kills the animal. And then there's the priest that uh, offers the burnt incense. And that happened in the morning. And that happened in the evening. And that happened every day. Zechariah had a 1 in 20,000 opportunity to be selected. I would say those are not good odds. Now, I hate that term because if it's your time with God, the odds are 100%. Right? You're getting picked. Zechariah, I also love this about Zechariah's story. It said he was, was it well along in years, very old? Hold on, let me find that. He was long in the tooth, yeah. Custom, righteous, both, oh, very old. <laughs> Do you want me to tell you how old, very old was in that culture? Because some of you are going to like cringe when you hear it, and some of you are going to be like, all right, I'm doing good. About 55, <laughs> 60. That was very old in that culture. In fact, this is what the best part about the whole thing was, I did some extra biblical research on this, Zachariah shouldn't even be there. He should be retired. Priests got to retire. Amen. Hey, all right, pastors ought to be able to retire. And I, I was doing some research on this. He should have probably been retired between 50 and 55. That was about retirement age. And I can only assume Zachariah was a righteous man, a godly man. This is extra biblical, by the way, so don't come up to me after and say, I think you were a little off. This is my opinion. So... I'm going to say it. He probably realized how much corruption there was, and he probably had a mentor spirit, and he had no son to pass this along to. And so he probably stayed on to help these young priests. Can you imagine? I'm the 32-year-old priest or 35-year-old priest, and I got selected last year to do it. And Zachariah, here comes Zachariah, 60 years old. He was about 60, we think. Hey, what was it like when you burned the incense? I got selected. Like, how cool would that have been? Can you imagine how he must have felt? And yet, when, when the angel comes, he didn't go, man, I was one in 20,000. Maybe that, no, he went to rate to doubt. He forgot that probably, well, we know, God had him in that position for a reason. And how quick we are to forget those things as Christians. If it doesn't fit in our own schema, if it doesn't fit with what we prayed for, God, you, get, you got the wrong guy. This isn't right. What are you talking about? This is not my door. God put us there for a reason. Glad Mr. Metzger is here tonight. He gave me this book about a year ago. This is probably the best book that I have ever read. It's called The Red Sea Rules. I've read it, I don't want to lie, two times and a half. And I'm going to read a, just a half a page out of here. And it's Red Sea Rule number one. Red Sea Rule, it's obviously about the people, the exodus. And it's uh, by a gentleman named Robert Morgan. And it's about, it's called Ten Given Strategies for Difficult Times. So I'm going to read you just a small segment. In the story of the Red Sea, the Israelites followed the pillar of cloud and fire as carefully as as possible, thrilled with their new freedom, full of excitement about the future. Yet as they followed him, God deliberately led them into a cul-de-sac between hostile hills, to the edge of the sea too deep to be forded and too wide to be crossed. The unmistakable implication of Exodus 14, 1 and 2 
is that the Lord took responsibility for leading them into peril. He gave them specific step-by-step instructions, leading them down a route to apparent ruin. Turn and camp, camp there, there, before the entrapping sea, yes, right there in that impossible place. The Lord occasionally does the same thing with us, testing our faith, leading us into hardship, teaching us wisdom, showing us his ways. Our first reaction may be a surge of panic or a sense of alarm, Zechariah. But we must learn to consult the scriptures for guidance. So take a deep breath and recall this deeper secret of the Christian life. When you are in a difficult place, realize that the Lord either placed you there or allowed you to be there for the reasons perhaps known only to himself. The same God who led you in will lead you out. And just so you know what that reference is, Exodus 14, 1 and 2. Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi-Hiroth between Migdal and the sea. They are encamp by the sea directly opposite baal Siphon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. A lot of people miss that. God told them to turn there, to camp there, to trap them there. And why? to show his mighty hand, to deliver them, and to smite Pharaoh. God picked Zechariah for a reason. To show his power. This is not just born in a manger, Jesus came, lowly birth. This is the coming of the Messiah, the forerunner. This is significant. And it starts with an old man and an old woman who walked with their God. I only have three more minutes. The implications of avoiding a Zechariah moment, and, and I know we have them, and I, I'm not standing up here. I hope it doesn't come across like I've got it figured out because, um, well, that, <laughs> that's just not true. And I've had a lot of Zechariah moments. But I was, as I was thinking about the implications of this, and this is where I really turned to my dad on this one, and uh, we started talking about this concept. And, and, uh, and when the prayers get answered or, or don't get answered, or again, they, they're not as, as what you thought they would be, you know, they're not the, going in their way or the direction you thought they would be. And, and when you doubt... This, this statement that he and I, he made, that there's two huge negative consequences to doubting God. The first is, Zechariah never got to enjoy the promise. Think about that. What is enjoyment in having children? Pre-children? You get to tell people. Remember that moment you got to call your dad, tell him you were having a child? I remember that moment. Now, notice what I didn't say. I didn't say he didn't get to have the promise. God was still gracious. He still got to have his son. He got to have John, the son he had prayed for. But he didn't get to tell anybody. That personal joy was stripped from him for 10 months. Man. And imagine the shame when John ran up and grabbed his leg when he was two and when he was three, and he had to look and go, I'm sorry I doubted you, God. Man. But the second really negative thing is, guess what was happening outside? People were waiting for him to come out and bless them, to tell them what he had seen. He didn't get to tell the people the Messiah was coming. And our unbelief silences us. If we doubt, we cannot speak truth. Unbelief silences us. And I have failed at this so many times. When I have an opportunity to witness and I say, Lord, there'll be another day. I don't want to. I'm nervous. That person leaves. That person's gone. That moment never comes. I wrote a letter to Pastor Calder seven, eight months ago. 
And I just started praying, God, give me people to witness to. And if you give me the moment, I will speak truth. And he has. And I have been amazed at how powerful that prayer is. And in closing, I'll say this. It could be something as little as you yourself being encouraged. You might not even have the opportunity to lead them to Christ. I was pumping gas at Sam's last week. It was a beautiful night. We call it a bear-killing night. It was a beautiful night. And there was this older gentleman. I won't say he was very old. He was older. Older than me. And you know those giant cement tubes that surround the pumps so people don't crash into them? He was just leaning on it. And I got out of the car, and we were close. We were probably not social distancing, but we were really close to each other. And I got out and pumped gas, and of course I had to get like $40 worth, so you know how long that takes. And uh, I just had that, you need to witness to this man. And I was like, Lord. I almost said, there's not enough time. I can't witness to a man in two minutes. And I thought, If you provide the way, I'll do it. And that man looked at me. He said something about the weather. I said, it's a beautiful weather. And then he said, how are you doing today, sir? And I said, sir, I'm doing great because I serve an awesome God. And he looked at me and he said, we do serve an awesome God, don't we? And I said, that's right, because he sent his son for us. And he said, amen. And I don't know who that was for. If that was for me, if that was for him. Probably both. But I would encourage you tonight, as you hopefully ponder what I've said, you read Luke 1 again, because you're maybe like thinking about it differently now, I hope that you take away the fact that we will all have a Zachariah moment. There are some ways to avoid it. But more importantly, the Zachariah moment will silence us. And so... What I love about Zechariah, and it's a message for another day, is that God gave him another chance to speak. He was redeemed. He messed up with the people. He didn't get to say the Messiah was coming, but he wrote John, and he was free. His tongue was free. And I think as Christians, there's a lot to take out of Zechariah. And I hope, again, for you folks, it is we need to be bold so we can speak truth to enjoy God's promises and lead others to Christ. Bow your heads with me. God, you are an awesome God. I feel completely unworthy to be up here in front of these folks, and I pray that you would bless the simplicity of my words to go out and accomplish what they were meant to accomplish tonight. Lord, I pray that for every service that happens in this building. And I pray that your house and this stage would be viewed not as a stage, but as a platform to share your truth. And I thank you that this church is one in which the truth is spoken, that the salvation message and invitation is given weekly. And Lord, that this church would be alive and winning and bringing souls to Christ. I pray that a blessing on these people as they go out tonight, Lord, as they enter into another work week, that they would be challenged and emboldened to pray to you, Lord, give me somebody to witness to. And if you just provide the option, the opportunity, I'll speak truth and just let you work. And that is the beautiful thing about you, Lord, is you will work in such wondrous ways. Some of them we might not even see and know, but Lord, you're going to work and you want a willing people to do your work. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. Keep us safe as we travel home. In your name, amen.